Good morning. It is, it is great to follow Lori. I haven't seen Lori since I left Lawrence Livermore, probably. At Salishan, there we go. So um, I came from Lawrence Livermore and came to Intel about two years ago. So it's always fun to see uh, the old people. So in fact, we'll start. We're going to talk about technology transformation, kind of innovation, because I think that's the core of what we do at high performance computing. And if, even if we want to talk about high performance computing, it was called supercomputing. And super was the unclassified term for the hydrogen bomb. So if we go back to uh, Lawrence Livermore heritage, that you know, high performance computing was basically used for national security. And now it's kind of what uh, most of the industries use as their secret sauce. My goal and my intention of coming to Intel was to democratize HPC. So I want it to be the secret sauce of curing cancer and you know, solving world hunger and all these other things. But we also want to make sure it, it meets all of your uh, needs too. I don't know how to move forward though. <laughs> Down here? Ah, okay, thank you. I don't know which one to, which buttons. So just talking about evolution of technology, um, we can take, think about the GPS and how it has also transformed from looking to, at the star, stars, excuse me, to a compass, to then looking and we pretty much use the phone. And this one just uh, kind of made me smile when I saw that the team had put this one together because my job between high school and college was at AAA doing the triptychs. And I'm aging myself, right, right now? I was the one drawing those orange you know, highlighters, that uh, path. And I, I was thinking about it, and I don't even have a map in my car. Isn't that, it kind of made me feel a little strange. I mean, I really, nobody now even has a map. Um, we're so dependent upon that mobile device to get us. And that's how technology has really changed, even the way in 20 years of how we would go from point A to point B. And I think that's just kind of an underlying theme of um, technology across the board. So, and it's all based on innovation. It's based on making those leapfrog advances that um, is the reason why maybe most of us kind of like this world of technology because we get to be put, pushing that leading edge. And I think that's why, another reason why I love being at Intel. So I'm gonna talk about our the past 50 years of advances at Intel. And we celebrated our 50th anniversary just last year. So it, we started in memory. Um, we were the world's first metal oxide semiconductor static RAM product in 1968. And some of the other advances as we walk through in the 70s, whether we went to the 8-bit, 16-bit microprocessor, to the 1980s, that was when we first started in supercomputing, but we were also the 8080 in the IBM PC. So it was the first PCs and um, Intel chip was inside those. And then in the 1990s, in fact, Lori and I were both at Sandia. I don't know if you were there in the 90s yet, but um, Red Storm with the, the uh, supercomputer as part of the original ASCII program and kind of our second iteration of supercomputing, going through uh, the Atom, which is our multi-threaded, multi-core processor, uh, mini-core, sorry, and then now where we're looking at 5G, 3D crosspoint, Optane storage, and we'll go through some of these technologies that we have today. And I really want to talk about, so we've had a past of technology innovation. And I think that's, that's core to what Intel is and where we're going and our core of technology innovation for where we're going in the future. So this is gonna be our focus. We talked about um, the different decades. Now we're gonna talk about really six pillars 
that are going to be the foundation of Intel moving forward. So these are our six pillars that are going to be highly interconnected as we move forward and um, the next 50 years of innovation. So we'll quickly go through these. I don't have time to do the due diligence to really talk about each one of these. I could spend an hour in each one of these doing a deep dive. So I'm just gonna give a quick flyby. And obviously, um, we would love to tell you more about these. Some of these also are not prime time. So there's some that you're gonna be hearing more and more about over this next year or two. So first, I think process technology is at our core. Um, whether we talk about um, going, you know, I can't even remember. I remember 22 nanometer to 14 nanometer, and we're talking about the transition to 10 nanometer and then to 7 nanometer. Yes, we have had a hard time getting to 10 nanometer. I'll be the first one to acknowledge that. It has been more challenging than we had expected. The good news is that we have figured out the fundamental issues and now we are even um, ahead of where we expect it to be. So that is exciting for us because we will be able to bring those 10 nanometer products that we have been waiting for uh, sooner to market. We also look at this diversity of products that we have to um, develop that's because we all need different products. So you can talk about whether you need a high performing and you can afford the power envelope to the lower IGPU, which is a lower performance, but it also is the lower power. So whether you're at the edge or the data center, you can have all of these different, um, basically it says no single transistor can meet all the design points that we're doing. But the main focus is we're gonna to continue to work on our process technology, which has been core at Intel throughout its 50 year history and continue to deliver leading edge technology on that process. Part of that is how we're gonna do integration. And we had a, a pretty good discussion about this last night at dinner about now it's not just linear, um, getting denser and denser, we're talking about doing 3D stacking, right? And that's um, Foveros. Now this is a follow on to EMIB, which we introduced in 2018. But now we're gonna be talking about actually packaging things like CPUs, GPUs. So it's not just memory, 3D stacking and memory, but actually stacking of IP. And I think one of the most exciting things about this is when I talk to customers is we're talking about maybe wanting semi-custom chips. So this will give us the ability to do different IP on a base chip, whether you want a CPU and a GPU on the same basically chip, but you can put those different IPs together. So it's a mixer and match type portfolio as we go there. Obviously, we're just starting. Foveros, the first uh, release will be the end of this year. So well, we say second half in 19. Um, so expect to start seeing this. And I think it's really going to change the way we look at chips. The thing, of course, I'm scared about is we already have all these SKUs, right? How can we add even more? So it's gonna be an interesting challenge of um, figuring out what you need and then being able to deliver it to you. But I, I'm excited for that challenge. We also look at four different architectures or four different compute architectures as the basis for what we are doing um, to meet all of the needs. When we talk about no one transistor can meet all the needs, well, there's different types of even maybe workloads for these needs, whether it's scalar, which is your traditional um, branching technology that we use uh, your Xeon platform. The vector technology, which is more of the GPU based. So that's for the highly parallel, we call them embarrassingly parallel codes. But definitely if you have a lot of performance or compute to do. And then we have AI, which we call matrix. And this is more for your neural networks. And again, it's our Nirvana platform is an example of this. And last is spatial. I, the thing that is in market today 
would be our FPGA. But um, we had just talking about control diverged workflows, really needing that spatial architecture in order to um, meet those performance needs and being able to do it in a very uh, power smart way. So that's going to be an interesting when we look more and more at spatial. So we say you're going to need these four different compute architectures. And you're going to need memory. Um, as our compute density or has grown with Moore's law, so the ability to um, is grown exponentially. But memory has been growing linearly. And we've kind of hit that memory wall. And so what we are looking at doing is creating this hierarchy of converged memory and storage. So we have the hot tier down to the colder tier. And starting with high um, bandwidth memory, so HBM through DRAM, and then we're introducing this Optane persistent memory class that will be closer. You can have it in two different modes, and so you have that memory mode or app mode, and so that you can be closer to and have persistent memory. So again, we can go from um, microseconds in, um, in latency all the way up through um, uh, nanoseconds at the higher end. And that's kind of what we're looking at. So this tier of memory performance across all of these spectrum. And again, coming out with new products to fit in within that tier. But it only works if you can connect it all together. So that's again where we get to the interconnects. And, um, Again, we're talking about, again, the on-die package will have the, the fastest, obviously. Moving on up until we um, have a lot of work in our silicon photonics, and we're doing POCs in that area, on up through to 5G. And 5G is another big push for us at Intel, and, um, well, not just Intel, across the world, obviously, as we're looking at 5G and cloud. So again, we have the full interconnect strategy, and again, this is a very high-level freeze-by view. Security is core to what we do at every single level, whether we're starting at the basic level with our quick assist technology, our crypto acceleration, to the SOC level, where you're going to be looking at the software guard extensions, um, there are SGX work, and also virtualization, trying to keep uh, memory separate so we can keep it, so we can do uh, patches with two specific areas at the SOC level. Two on the board where we're doing the BIOS obviously and firmware, so how you do that, and um, boot guard, then all the way up to the platform level where we have the identity protection technology both at data and at the, the higher level. So this is, security is a big push, and I think what we're trying to show here is we're not just looking at it at the transistor level or down at the chip level. We're really looking at it throughout that whole system, and we're looking at it across the full ecosystem. So it's a part of our software strategy, part of our hardware strategy. And the last, and very important part of this whole six pillar strategy is our software. And do not get tied to one API because the branding has not happened there. So, um, but really what this is, is a common developer um, environment for those four different computer architecture, compute architectures, scalar, vector, matrix, and spatial. And the goal is to make it unified and simplified um, interface. So you won't have to worry about what the hardware is, that it will um, be on top of that hardware. I know in HPC we want to get down to the bare metal, and that we will still provide that. I think the other thing with HPC, um, don't expect Fortran to be part of one API, but it will be compatible with one API. So all the tools that you're used to, at Intel will all be compatible with this one API. 
We will be rolling this out again at the end of 2019. So you'll be getting a lot more information about this software platform. And I think um, it's a huge undertaking. And um, I, one of the things that I'm probably most excited about, because if we look at traditionally, and, and I know we've talked a lot about this when I was at Lawrence Livermore, you invest in the hardware and the software is always the last thing to come along, right? And so I'm thrilled that we're saying, oh, we've got to invest in the software and the, the whole stack in order to make that hardware work, especially when we're looking at all of those different compute architectures. So that's kind of an overview, a very, very high level flyby of what Intel is investing in in our innovation for the next 50 years. And I, you'll continue to see um, new releases, new announcements along these six pillars. So stay tuned, I would guess, would be the big thing. So let's talk about innovation within HBC itself. So this, that was the overall Intel innovation. And just at the DCG level, so within, um, we're part of the data center group. And what we work on a lot is Xeon, the basis for um, most of the workloads, but we also have the Nervada and our FPGA, so the neural network platform and the FPGA. Talking about Stormore, so that's the foundation of, and I, I talked about the DC persistent memory, but our opt-on, Optane SSDs, and then also move faster, which is our connectivity, whether um, we're looking at the advances in silicon photonics or Ethernet and our Omnipath. On top of that, we have a full ecosystem that we develop, whether it is the MKL DNN, so our math kernel libraries, we have the deep learning frameworks with uh, PyTorch, CAFE2, we support all of that. We also have obviously the deep learning environments, OpenVINO. And then what we try to do, because this is a lot, I understand there's a lot there, we try to give you solutions that bundle it together and make it easier for you to digest if if those are the things that you need. And so whether it's with our genomic stack or our um, fraud detection, we're also looking at two new solutions we're doing as a big stack solution, DL big stack, and we're looking at how to do Slurm or Unova solutions so that you can talk about that converged workload loads and uh, I'll bring that up in a second. So kind of, yes, we have a very broad data center portfolio. I think the key takeaway is we don't just focus on the chip level, we also focus on this full ecosystem, and we fo focus on a platform that our partners then can pick up and work with. So HBC obviously is evolving and expanding, and we know this, we're working um, Closely, Lori talked about the whole Exascale initiative, and so we are the first U.S. Exascale machine at Argonne National Labs. We also have a broadening in scope. We do see this convergence of AI and high-performance computing. I'll talk a little bit about that. And we're also looking at delivery of HPC in the cloud. Um, when I talk to people, in the oil and gas community, it's, I don't see as much of that um, cloud delivery, but I see a lot of interest maybe more at the university level. And, and so we can also talk about how to make sure the work that you do at your HBC center can be burst to the cloud. Um, what are the right workloads to burst to the cloud? So we're doing a lot of investigation in that work too. So let's talk about this convergence and Traditionally, you've had this dedicated cluster sitting, um, you know, doing with the hard disk storage and traditional HPC interconnects and your mod simulation, right? We all know and love it. And today we're starting to see people that want to do some AI. And I think the, the thing that we would tell most people is um, if you're dabbling in AI, just use what you have. Don't go off and buy new infrastructure for it. 
Use what you have. Xeon is honestly the basis for 95% of the whole AI workload. If you just look at all the work you need to do for that. But we see it's disaggregated right now. We have a Hadoop cluster. We'll have our mod sim cluster. They're usually not the same thing. And what we envision is this converged platform. And I believe that the HPC infrastructure, so the work, the infrastructure that we, have, we all love, we all are used to, is going to be the basis for most of compute infrastructure in the future. If you look at the needs of high performance data analytics and the needs of artificial intelligence, they need that low latency, they need that high performance. And so all the work that we've been doing is going to be the basis. I think we're gonna become incredibly popular people uh, in our companies because we know how to do this work. And uh, just some of the use cases that um, right now we are working with some oil and gas companies are, and these are what I, they're traditional machine learning. They're very, you know, at the beginning of where you would say there's a convergence with AI. Whether it's submersive vehicles going down and looking at the oil rig and looking for corrosion underneath and then having AI or a train network look for corrosion and you can speed up that whole process versus the human eye. Or in worker safety, making sure that the workers taking pictures of the workers when they're entering into those safety zones, that they have all the protective gear on. And then flagging, they can do that faster, a lot of times and more accurately than having guards watching. And then I think moving into where we can do some more reservoir prediction, where we're actually um, working with a company to use machine learning to see where the machine believes are the highest potential areas for future drilling. So starting to then take that and say, okay, put that part of the workflow. I was at Lawrence Livermore a month ago, maybe, I don't know, about a month ago, and, and they're actually taking, um, they're doing active deep learning where they're taking results from uh, machine learning classical machine learning exercise, inserting it into your simulation and running that and finding that it's speeding up the results um, by 10 times, even more, I think. I'm not even sure exactly how much, but they're finding that it's um, increased their ability to solve problems in a much faster way. And I'm seeing more and more of this as I go out and talk to customers, how we're not just talking about physics models anymore, we're actually talking about data models and using those two together to get to the right answer or to a faster answer, who knows if it's the right answer, right? Closer to the right answer. So I think we're gonna see more and more of this as we move forward. And this is when we talk about this one converged workload where you have that basis and it will be based on high performance infrastructure and talk about having whatever the different, the biggest challenge right now is the resource manager and the job scheduler in getting this to all work on the same platform. And so that's why we're working with Slurm and Unova to bring in some solutions to start bringing that together. But through one API, we're hoping that we can bring the, what we need so that we would have a single software stack that can control your different workloads. And what I envision is it will be a workflow with these multiple workloads. And especially as we talk about needing this different type of IP or compute architectures, whether you're going to have a scalar or spatial, I mean, just envision the ability to put um, your CPU and GPU right next, to get, right next to each other, along with maybe a matrix or some kind of a neural network. And you wouldn't have to, the code could figure out which one it should use. And wouldn't that be awesome? But of course, maybe that would take our jobs away. But anyway, let's imagine that as a future and something to drive forward because that's gonna be what we really need to solve some of these big problems that we have facing us. 
So again, I talked about you know Xeon being the basis for a lot of the work, especially if you are looking at um, AI, if you're looking at moving into the cloud basis, that is the foundation for a lot of the cloud infrastructure. Um, and so that's gonna be your basic infrastructure. We do have the Cascade Lake. Uh, we have made that announcement and we're gonna have the big launch in April and are coming out with both Cascade Lake and then the Cascade Lake Advanced Performance. And so this will be the highest single node performance out on the market, along with 12 DDR4 memory channels. Um, so very exciting for a lot of the HPC workloads, specifically designed for HPC. We're also gonna have DL Boost as part of this and VNNI. So again, it's going to be able to run your HPC workloads and that some of the, the um, deep learning, machine learning that we're just beginning to experiment with in the HPC space. And then we also, uh, along with our Cascade Lake, will be our Optane DC persistent memory. And so that will be um, working closely with Cascade Lake so that you can look at those different use cases of that different tier of memory hierarchy. I always want to push the wrong button. So that was, again, an extremely quick flyby of where we're trying to go at Intel, both at the high level Intel and also within our HPC space. We're talking about that diverse mix of scalar vector matrix and spatial architectures designed in you know, doing state-of-the-art process technology, disruptive memory hierarchies, uh, advanced packaging, where we talk about um, Fav Favaros as uh, that next move beyond EMIBs, the interconnects, and then obviously the software is key to putting that all together, and always, always having security as a foundation for what we do. So that is, uh, the in that's Intel, and so I left actually two minutes for questions. We have a question, and Dan, could you come up and start plugging in while we, you know. Any questions? Oh, here, over here. Uh, hi, I have a question. I noticed that one of your use cases was safety. You know, um, I've been a safety engineer before, and one of the issues I've often had is that we often have unstructured data and structured data that defines safety within uh, refineries, offshore rigs, and so forth. How does Intel want to handle the unstructured data? How do we bring in things like operator comments and logs that give context what's going on in the field? So I think, thank you, oh, sorry. Um, so, I mean, that's part of our, I mean, we can, we can, um, use structured and unstructured data in our data in the machine learning area. We can, um, I mean, whether you label it, I mean, there's different ways we can work with it, but I definitely, we have a lot of use cases where we've shown that we can combine them. You don't just have to have structured data. I mean, it's easier, but we're definitely combining those. Trish, we have one more question over here. Okay. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> come on. That's okay. <laughs> Hi, Dan. <laughs> Hi. I was just wondering, could you comment a little more on where Nirvana is going, Loihi? I know you have a neuromorphic computing Nirvana. initiative out there. Last time I checked, only academics had signed on, no industry representatives. Where is that going? So, I mean, we, we're always looking at where is computing going. Um, and I think, so Nirvana is part of it. Nirvana has the Crest family and the Hill family. And um, we have... Lake Crest out with the customers. Spring Crest is coming, so stay tuned. Um, and I think we'll continue to look at how, what is the right compute you need to do that machine learning, that deep learning, and that's really where Nirvana is king. Not just deep learning um, training, but also inference. Um, and so we have the Hill family coming out along with those lines. As far as the neuromorphic, we have a neuromorphic effort, Loewy, and, and it is still in the research or pathfinding phase. We also have a quantum effort 
um, which is also in the pathfinding phase. So I think um, as far as innovation, you've got to be investing in those future technologies. I worked uh, for a while at the National Ignition Facility, and Fusion was always 50 years out. So I don't know how long quantum is out, you know. It used to be 50 years out. Um, but amazing, um, some of the work that they're doing there, and maybe there will be some um, opportunities to use it sooner. Let's hope. Right. Join me in thanking our speaker again.